is and settle in with us for the hour as our panel unravels how to address the leaders in your company when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So let's get to our speakers. We're joined today by one of our senior researchers here at NLI who has been instrumental in our allyship work and is also deeply knowledgeable on the relevant science and research when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, Michaela Simpson. Hello, Michaela. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Gabe. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to have you. And our second panelist is the head of our diversity, equity, and inclusion practice. She's been tirelessly listening to and partnering with countless companies to evolve their strategies into modern progressive cultures. Esther Niznanova. Hello, Esther. Thanks for being here today. Hi, Gabe. Excited to be here today. Excellent. And today's session will be facilitated by our CEO and co-founder, Dr. David Rock. Hello, David. Are you ready to get us started? I am. Great to be here with you, Gabe. Am I coming through loud and clear? Yeah, sound great. Fantastic. Great to be here with you all. And thanks, uh, Michaela and Esther, for working on this session. Um, this is a, a topic that's, I, I know, near and dear to a lot of people. And I, I didn't realize how much this theme was coming up in conversations, especially over the last you know, three or four months, um, and just how many kind of similar conversations we we're having. So I kind of looked back and went, wow, this is everyone keeps thinking about this, asking about this. And so I wanted to kind of start to frame up our thinking on the right ways to actually engage leaders. And I, I should warn you, there are some provocations here. There are some counterintuitive things here. Um, and we're really interested in your feedback. We've got a couple of polls that we're going to have. Uh, we're really, really interested to hear from you. So get the, uh, get your, your chat fingers ready um, to kind of share your experiences as well. We're going to learn from that together. Um, for those new to us, uh, we are uh, 22 years old, uh, operations in 24 countries, advisor to over 50 of the Fortune 100. And uh, our work is making organizations more human through science. And we do that by activating, helping companies activate the right habits at scale. We build habit activation strategies based on real research. And we continuously push out new research, as those of you following us uh, since March, perhaps for the first time are seeing, uh, we're very active in studying things and uh, since March, ridiculously active uh, in kind of really, really looking at trends and trying to find the signal in the noise. And that's what we wanted to do today. So um, Esther, do you want to take it away with kind of a little bit of the framing of sort of how we think about, um, you know, change uh, across DEI? Yes, definitely. Thank you, David. Um, so when we think about culture transformation, there are really three essential elements to drive culture transformation at scale and also be able to drive for long-term success. And those are priorities, habits, and systems. The first one priority is, are the goals and changes that your organization wants? But also priorities is, how do your employees actually hear those goals and changes? So for instance, if you're saying it's important to be an inclusive leader, what do the employees actually hear? The third main component and priority is, is the leadership buy-in and the leaders really driving the efforts forward, which is what we will be talking about today. The second essential element um, of driving cu culture transformation is the habit formation. So when you said something is important, what are some of the habits that you're driving to make sure that the goals are met? And practicing new behaviors and new habits is essential in culture transformation. Now, the third element is the systems. And the systems is the overall ecosystem of your organization. That includes talent management systems, that include business systems, your DEI systems, how you communicate. It's almost like a canvas for your whole organization. And I'm sure you know that we can set goals and that's why New Year's resolutions, we see it every year. We can set goals and even start practicing the habits. But if we don't do the systems part, if you're trying to be more healthy, but at the same time you have a lot of junk food everywhere in your apartment, then it doesn't really drive towards your goals. So these are the three key elements that really drive culture transformation. Well, that's great. Michaela, you know, you're one of our key researchers, key scientists. You want to take us away with just kind of one click down on this? For, right, for a just to one click down. So um, Esther already described what we mean by priorities. And just to kind of uh, hone on that, that's about creating intentions to act. It has to do with our intentions and our motivation. And one of the things we need to be mindful of um, when we set priorities for an organization and we want, you know, um, our, our people to buy into it, we actually, they do need to buy into it. And we need to realize um, that just generally as human beings, 
we do best and we follow through best when we have what's called intrinsic motivation, when it comes from within, while we know why we're doing something and it's kind of self-determined why we do it rather than, um, you know, there's an external reward or punishment. So it's really important for leaders to understand that we need all buy-in in order, you know, if we, if we establish priorities, it's important to have the buy-in. And then, and there's that motivation there. And motivation, when we have priorities, it directs our attention, our cognitive resources towards our priority, towards our goal. So it's really important to have that alignment um, with, uh, the priorities and the motivation, because then again, we can, you know, use our brain, our cognitive resources, our attention, our, our working memory to work towards implementing those goals. And um, moving on to habits, as we all know, kind of practice, well, we say practice makes better. Um, and so habits are formed through repetitive behavior. And when we start introducing a new idea, it can be a little bit clunky, right? It's, it's a conscious effort. Um, and we need to do that repetitively, repeatedly. And when we do that, then it becomes more automatic and more non-conscious. Um, but first we need to take those steps and be really mindful. So it's again, very important for leaders to uh, help establish clear behaviors that everybody can work towards. Um, because when they're clear, and what we say sticky means it's easy to remember what the new behavior is or the new habit that we want to employ, um, then it makes it easier. And then when it's meaningful to us, it makes it even more easier, uh, more easy for us to um, engage in those behaviors that will lead to habits. And although we engage in new behaviors with the intention to form habits, we have to sustain the habits. So we need to repeat them, but they need to be consistently sustained, which is where systems comes in place because systems can create that container, um, that environment in which we can support those new behaviors we're trying on and that we're building. And um, so I think I'll leave it at that unless David, you want to add a little bit more. No, it's great. Just, you know, there's a lot of research, like decades of research showing people over index on the priority stage. People assume that they've got to get that part right. And it's more that that's just easier to think about. You know, we think about what's easy, not what's right. To think right. About. And, and that's the first step, right? Because then you actually have to actualize, you actually have to implement and, mm. and follow through. Um, yeah, so the, the systems are that. sort of the systems are kind of, you know, also a little bit concrete. So the sort of priorities are concrete, the systems are concrete, the habit work is sort of abstract and the brain doesn't like abstract thing. It sort of goes to the concrete. So that's our work, the habits. And then, you know, the real question is which habits really have an impact and why and how and all that, but that's for another time. Let's dig in a little more as to take, you know, talk to us about how this looks as it sort of hits an organization. Yeah, so that's the fascinating part because when we start working with the organizations around their diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies, we notice that the first step was actually often missed. So we talk to the leaders about our goals, but we actually don't mobilize the leaders fully before we build the strategy. That's why the first step is actually mobilizing your leaders, which we will talk about later. The second step is building long-term sustainable strategies based on priorities, habits, and systems. And after you've built those strategies, you're activating the habits and reimagining your enterprise systems to drive for long-term change. And, and this, you know, we, we wanted to sort of lay this out and show you kind of these different stages because, you know, th these are quite different stages of work you have to do kind of living on top of, um, on top of PHS, but the, the thing to know is that, you know, mobilizing leaders is really important, um, but it's very much the first step, but it's, it's harder than it looks. And that's what we want to dig into. So this is sort of some background, I guess, but now let's get into today's topic. Like what does it take to really mobilize leaders? And the first insight that I want to share about this um, is that you can't mobilize leaders. <laughs> You can't just think about mobilizing leaders because they're, they're in many different places. You can't actually have one strategy for mobilizing leaders. You actually need to think about them on a bell curve. There are people who are passionate advocates on the right here, right? Who, who are super inspired about diversity, equity, and inclusion, living it, breathing it, you know, championing it, all, the, you know, all of that. Then there are people who are generally bought in, not particularly active. Maybe some of them are on the fence, right in the middle. That's maybe the bigger group. We're going to get a poll from you in a moment. Um, 
And then there's people who are actively pushing back, right? And there are people who are saying, this is wrong. We should be focused on making money. This is a distraction or that. And, you know, a strategy, you know, when you think about a strategy, you should be really thoughtful about who the strategy is for, right? If it's a, you know, if it, it, cause certain strategies will work really differently depending on kind of the bulk of where your people are. So, you know, as you think about mobilizing your leaders, you know, make sure you think about where they are now and the different kinds of strategies that you might need to use. That's the, the cliff note, but let's, let's do a quick poll from you. We'd love to, to hear, you know, where, where do you think most of your leaders, where do you think the bulk of your leaders are? Now it's not a very scientific question. We'd have to get kind of three data points, but just generally, where would you say the, the largest percentage of people are uh, in, in your organization? And this is anonymous. We won't be tracking to which company you are. So feel free to be as, honest as you can. Um, so we'll see uh, what the numbers come in as we've got 76. Let's see if we can get over 100. We've got over 80. Let's see if we can get a few more. Where do you believe most of your leaders sit on the bell curve? Let's get another, give it another 10 seconds. We can get a couple more people. Um, it's such an interesting thought, isn't it? Because you, you, you know, what you you, you might automatically have a bias, maybe an experience bias. If you're passionately advocate, you know, a passionate advocate, you would probably have an experience bias. We would assume other people are sort of easily convinced to, to, to be like that. And we have a thing called the false consensus effect, which is we automatically assume other people think like us, but you know, actually they don't mostly. So let's have a look at the data. Uh, we've got a hundred and something. Um, so we've got 69% generally bought in. So that's, you know, correlates with other data we see out there. So about 70% kind of in the middle. Um, but 17% also think that the, the largest group of people are actively pushing back. That's one in five companies on this line. The largest group of people are pushing back actively. Um, and 12%, the largest group of people are passionate advocates. It's a really interesting thought. I'm just gonna take a quick look. At, uh, do you wanna have a look at the chat as well, Esther Michaela, see if there's any sort of quick comments before we go to the next chapter? Yes, I also wanted to challenge us a little bit here because um, when I go into companies and when I really start working on leadership buy-in, we often tend to see that um, the DNI team actually thinks that the leaders are generally bought in. Yet when we start actually holding the executive sessions and the workshops and diving into how the DNI strategy or diversity inclusion, how they understand it, how that ties to their business goals there is no clear understanding there most of the time. So here, I would also challenge what bought in is, as well as what is generally bought in, because if they say, yes, diversity is important, it's one thing. But if they actually understand how that ties to their business goals or how that ties to their, uh, how that has an emotional connection for them and why it's important on a human level, that is a totally different level than them actually saying that they're bought in. Right. We're going to dig into that in a minute as well. Um, and there's something, you know, there's something I want to share here and, and we're going to dig further into this point at the summit coming up. Uh, we've got a session on strategic d &I. It's the opening of day three. And in fact, the opening of each day is a free streamed session. So this one probably have thousands and thousands in it. But the opening of day three, which is the 12th of November, we're going to dig further into this question of basically, what do you do now? Like, what are the different approaches? Should you, you know, approach the middle? Or should you empower the passionate advocates to move the middle along? Mm -hmm. Or should you go after those actively pushing back? Or should you ignore them? Right? Um, like what's the right focus? And it can be very easy because of kind of a safety bias to end up really putting attention on the people actively pushing back. But is that where you get the biggest return? Or could you kind of bring those people along if you get, a re if you get the middle you know, bigger? So we're gonna dig into that question and all the science around that at the summit. Um, but I think you, you wanna be intentional about that choice is the point that we're making here. You know, is, is be really intentional about who you're going after, not just automatically go after the, you know, the active pushing back. Michaela, do you want to comment? David, I just add that when we're more intentional with anything we do, we're more likely to succeed in our endeavors. So intention is really important. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. All right. So let's dig into kind of the guts of the session today, for want of a better word, the heart of the session, perhaps, um, which is, is we were thinking about like all the different approaches that we use at NLI and thinking about sort of the differences between them. Um, and this is some first thinking. So if we've got anything wrong, let us know, tell us what you like, 
that we should do more of and tell us what we could do differently. So, you know, we may be missing some things, but this is sort of our first thoughts on kind of the three ways that you can mobilize leaders and the pluses and minuses of each. Um, and so we're gonna kind of walk through each one, discuss them, maybe take your comments uh, as we go. So definitely, um, uh, you know, get your comments in the chat as you kind of talk through each one. Um, Esther, do you want to talk about the first one, activating emotional buy-in? What's your, your thoughts there? Oh, you're still muted. Um, sure, yes. Yeah. So um, the first part around activating uh, emotional buy-in, um, it is very important when we're striving for really getting a buy-in to make sure that the person is emotionally invested and understands how it relates to them on an emotional level, as well as understands the overall values level within it. And one of the biggest challenges here in diversity, equity, and inclusion space that we see is that that's kind of like the carrot or the stick problem where we see a lot of you have to do that because it's wrong not to, the stick part of it, and a lot of blame associated with the topics. And in reality, what ends up happening is that it actually pushes people away. So how do we come up with productive ways to challenge and productive ways to really bring everybody on board within it? And I know that there are also some traps, so I would love to hear from you, David, on the traps piece when it comes to emotional buy-in. Yeah, it's tricky, and I, I am also a bit, a bit delicate about how to speak here because I don't want to, you know, misspeak. But I mean, it feels right to do this. I mean, I'm a passionate advocate for um, diversity, equity, inclusion in every way in every part of my life. Like, it's. It, but but I also know the more passionate I get about it, the more people kind of pull away, right? If 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 they're not, and and I, I was thinking about this years ago, sort of the evangelist challenge you know when you're an evangelist about something doesn't it could be about an app right or dei like anything when you're really excited you sort of naturally want to share your enthusiasm right but what happens is people react to that enthusiasm with this sort of almost like a status attack like you're making their worldview wrong and they also feel like you're telling them what to do like you're telling them how to change and so you get a you're getting an autonomy attack so it's, it's a really difficult paradox you know you every bone in your body knows this is the right thing to do um, you, you are kind of an evangelist in a way, like you're passionate about this, right? And it feels so right to create an emotional connection to this work. Um, it does feel right, and it is right on so many levels, right? To tell people about the, um, you know, the, the, the pain that folks feel, that the hundreds of times that a person of color might feel, micro emotions, microaggressions a week, like the, you know, the incredible pain that people have felt. And yet it's, it, it has these unintended accidental um, kind of pushback. And, you know, what we've seen with the, you know, the, the, um, the, the government announcement about, you know, you can't do, you know, diversity training, for example, is, is sort of a, is, is this writ large in a way? This is, is kind of like, you know, I, I'm not going to take to being told that I'm, you know, bad. Uh, so you can't tell my government that I'm bad, right? So, you know, it's, it's really difficult, this one. It's a dilemma. And, um, you know, we, we, we've struggled with this, but it's, it's an important issue. Michaela, do you want to add something there or Esther? Um, I just want to speak to kind of that defensive piece or what um, Esther was talking about, the blame part, and I'd add the blame and shame and whether or not that's explicit and that might not be the intent, but some people might get the effect, oh, you're talking about me and I'm feeling shame. The point is when people feel defensive, they feel they might feel that they're blamed or shamed, whether or not that was the intention. Um, then people don't want to listen and they will not take in the information. And so to speak again to, you know, how do we speak to these things in a productive way? And David, I acknowledge that challenge you talk about when like you feel that something's right and you want to tell people this and like, why don't they understand? And like, you know, what is that internal experience of the other person? And I guess part of it is for understand that people are having some kind of internal experience that we might not be privy to that is creating this defensiveness and this not right. wanting to hear. Yeah. Um, it just reminds me of intent versus impact. You know, your intent's good, but your impact's completely different, right? And you know, the difference between intent and impact is, is, is important here. Esther? Yes, and to add to that as well, it goes back to the bell curve and making sure that we actually meet people where they're at as well as use the science productively, right? So we talk a lot about SCARF and the importance when you want to actively include to actually send positive SCARF yeah. signals within all of those. So 
we can yeah. definitely use it here as well. Yeah, right. it's an interesting comment from, from Chrissy. We, we, you know, we're keeping an eye on the chat too. So please put your comments and thoughts and connections in the chat. But interesting comment from Chrissy. Like the challenge is we all have bias, tremendous amount of bias, um, but we actually don't see our own bias or very much of it. We see snippets of it. Um, remember that sort of consciously we can process about a, cu a cubic foot unconsciously. There's the Milky Way in our own brain, like stuff we can't access. Um, so it's there's enormous amounts going on that we cannot access in ourselves, uh, but we can see other people's you know being biased in real time, and so so there's this weird paradox, and this has been studied. There's tons of data on this that everyone thinks they're above average driver. You've heard that research, you know, which is impossible. Everyone thinks everyone else is biased, also much more biased than them. But the reason for that is that the way our brain is tuned, we can't see infrared and we can't see calcium. Uh, we also can't see our own bias. It's, it's just a thing we can't do, but we can see other people's. So, you know, your, their, their lived experience, um, their lived experience is that they don't really have bias. And you come along and say, hey, you've got bias. They're like, no, I don't, but I'll tell you who does. Um, and then, you know, there's this weird thing that happens. So it's, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting challenge. Esther, do you want to address the comment about the, the government diversity training and just to sort of get that behind us? About stereotyping and gender and race. Um, yes, so um, there, it evolved a lot um, this week, and so there have been specific guidelines around what uh, the government officials are supposed and not supposed to be learning about, and as part of that, um, everything around um, race, racism, anti-racism, as well as unconscious bias, there's a clear guideline that there shouldn't be training within it. So I can see the comment and yet there has been a lot of evolution there. I will say that back to your point, David, often it goes back to lack of deep understanding around what those terms necessarily yeah. mean. Um, so when it comes to unconscious bias, the way we approach it is from the science standpoint and decision-making for instance, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. the, the Tracy kind of got it there. They're, they're not against diversity training. We, we have actually checked with a number of big yeah. government agencies we're working with. We're, we're doing some huge rollouts of, of uh, work right now on bias with some major government agencies. We check with them and we're actually able to continue. There was no issue because we're not doing that kind of shaming, blaming path um, in that sense. So I'm, I'm treading a little carefully, but, um, yeah. you know, let's continue because I think there's, there's more coming. Um, so, the, so the, the first approach to mobilizing leaders, remember we're talking about mobilizing leaders, not building habits, right? We're just talking about how do you mobilize leaders? And you know, to someone's point earlier as well, um, all leaders need to be mobilized, but of course leaders at the top need to be mobilized, right? But really all leaders need to be mobilized. But you know, the first strategy is kind of tap into their emotions. We're not saying that's a bad thing, but you know, you've got to tread carefully and, and think about how you do it. The second strategy that kind of is almost like the next most obvious thing, like, okay, so we're not going to tap their emotions. What we're going to do instead is focus on outcome studies. We're going to show them that it's logically good, right? And this is where sort of the, the DEI world has been for some years, um, that, that everyone sort of felt like, oh, if we just had enough data, we could convince leaders that DEI is good. Um, and so when I, when I say outcome studies, I mean kind of research showing that it has a positive effect, right? And so we organized all the literature we could find uh, a few years ago uh, into essentially four benefits of, um, of diversity, equity, inclusion. It's really DEI these days, but four benefits, financial benefits, there's tons of studies, innovation benefits, tons of studies, go to market benefits, right? Talent pool benefits. And we were able to say, look, there's just unequivocally large amounts of, of you know, clear evidence that this is good for business, right? Um, and, you know, here's an example. Do you want to walk through this just briefly, um, Esther? Just kind of bring this alive for a moment. It's just a couple of examples. Definitely. So when it comes to financial benefits, there are so many stud studies, including that, for instance, an increase in women to top management to 30% actually gives 15% uh, rise in productivity. But overall, it's higher cash flow, higher productivity, higher innovation, EBIT rises as well. So there are a lot of benefits. That being said, when we often do the outcome study uh, briefings to our leaders within the companies, the question is, 
are you actually making those numbers a lie, right? And are you connecting that to your leader's individual business goals and helping that see that from their level and their standpoint, other that, than almost like throwing numbers at them as to why that is important? It's sort of, it, it sort of Mikhail, I'll call on you and say, it sort of feels like um, th that we're trying to convince them with data. Do you know that thing about, you know, like if someone isn't convinced, doesn't matter how much data you throw at them, it doesn't really make a difference. And, and, and people just question the studies. They just like to argue the studies. You know, I mean, we literally can turn up with 10 amazing, fully referenced studies for each of these four things. And we did like two years ago, that was kind of where we were. Everyone was like, tell us the business case, tell us the business case. And we would turn up and everyone would just go, yep. And I could see no minds were changing. You know, I could see that in the room that minds were not changing. It was interesting. Mikado, do you want to add something there? Yeah, I just wanted to add kind of um, on what Esther was saying. Like, it's so important for the information. You know, if you do have facts and numbers, it needs to be relevant to people. They, people need to know, like, what does this have to do with me? How does this impact me? Hopefully it impacts on, you know, on an emotional level or, or some way that they can see how it applies to them. Because sometimes people are like, yeah, that doesn't really apply to me. I don't see, you know, everything's working fine the way it normally is. Why do I need to change anything? So it's really when we can make things more salient, where it's more relevant to an audience, again, it means it's more um, impactful and, and then it will, you know, create more of a change in people and create more of a shift. Because um, it's kind of like, what's, I mean, I don't mean to put it down to this level, but kind of what's in it for me, for people to like, ah, I get it. I see how this benefits my organization, my team, myself even. David, you're on mute. Yeah, it definitely helps. Mm -hmm. If someone's really focused on innovation, for example, like picking just the right innovation data and really hammering that home, like, so I totally agree with both of you, but I still found at the end of the day, it was like, oh, okay you know, so it's better, so I better do it. But I, I never really saw, and I did, I did like between 150 and 250 briefings um, over a couple of years using this kind of data, literally to uh, thousands of leaders. We stopped really anchoring on this um, a while back. Uh, maybe a year ago, we sort of stopped anchoring as much on this. We still have it. But just what I saw, even when we did that, it was better. Even when we did that, I just, I wasn't seeing kind of real commitment. I, unless unless essentially the sort of CEO and the, the C-suite said, we're doing this, you just, you have to get on board. Then maybe, you know, people would like, all right, I'll, you know, we'll do it, but sort of begrudgingly. Um, but this brings us to the third chapter. And Michaela, do you want to walk us through this? Or Esther, you had a comment first? I just really want to address one of the comments, questions in the chat. So Tom mentioned that uh, there's a strong belief in diversity and what they need to focus on is equity and inclusion, which is where the rubber really needs the road. And that's the second challenge with this specific approach, because when we talk about numbers, we really talk about diversity. And often we don't even understand that that goes beyond to cognitive diversity, to difference of styles, et cetera. But as we love to say, diversity is having a seat at the table, inclusion is having a voice and unconscious bias, why some voices are heard more than others. And what we see is that if you shift diversity, but you're not being inclusive, you don't shift inclusion, that leads to a revolving door of talent. So when you're persuading leaders when it comes to the data, make sure that you're not laser focused on shifting diversity numbers because that is not the point. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, we're gonna take questions in a few minutes. We'll just give you this third chapter here because I think it's important. We've talked about emotional buy-in. It feels like that's the most logical thing. That's the go-to, but it has some unintended consequences. We've talked about outcome studies. These are the categories from NLI's perspective of the outcome studies uh, to kind of really bring a live business case. But there's a third category, a third approach that Michaela will walk us through um, that we sort of landed on. And, and this is where we end up spending most time on. It seems to make the biggest difference. And it's kind of explaining the, 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 the actual mechanisms of how this works um, in, in a deep way. So yeah, Michaela, take us, uh, take us away there. Okay, I'm going to dive deeper into um, two uh, Harvard Business Review articles um, penned by David and um, some of our colleagues from NLI. And, and it's about diverse, diverse teams. And I do want to put the caveat right up front. Um, again, uh, Esther is always that great lead in for me. 
where you know I'm we're gonna be I'm going to be talking about diverse diversity and diverse teams, but also I want you to keep in mind that this is really only effective when people do feel that they're included and that they belong. So it's not just again as Esther said, let's just put in diverse people. Um, you need to have that sense of of inclusion and cohesion um, for it to really be effective. And so as you have probably already surmised or, or also I've understood when reading the industry literature, diverse teams do work better. They perform better. Um, uh, companies find they have better financial returns when you have diverse teams. And again, when we talk about diversity, it can be anything from diversity of thought, diversity of background to, you know, we call like the physical uh, attributes or signs of diversity. So across the board, diverse teams generally work better. Um, we find that they're more creative, they're more innovative, they generate more solutions, they focus more on facts and they remain objective. And you see here, it says they work harder. In a way, they have to work harder because they're not engaging in group think. You know, group think is, you know, people coming together, they're pretty similar, they think the same way, they don't really necessarily uh, think about other options and they just, and they don't necessarily question and everybody thinks the same. When you get somebody else who has a different perspective or more people or, or you know, a group of people with different perspectives, it's, a, it's going to be a harder work, right? Because it's not going to, you're not going to have this easy flowing feeling. It's like you have to work at it. You need to, you know, present your ideas, share ideas, understand other people's perspectives. But actually what they find is it leads to better performance. Um, so, for example, or just better decision making, uh, there are all kinds of studies, but there's one I'd like to highlight. highlight. There is one on um, mock jury panels, and there are different configurations. And basically, the ones where their mock, jury, uh, mock juries were um, diverse in that there were white people and black people on the mock jury, and they were uh, uh, judging somebody who was black who was accused of doing something against somebody who was white, they found that the diverse panels, they actually paid more attention to facts that were related to the case than the homogeneous groups, and they made fewer factual errors when they were discussing the available evidence. And if they got something wrong, they were likely to correct their, their kind of their wrong decision making when they were doing the deliberation. So we find that it can be a little bit uh, um, tough to engage when you're with a more diverse team, but you get better results. And David mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that diverse teams are more innovative. So there are all kinds of studies. Again, I could give you all kinds of outcome studies, but just know they find across the board, you know, if they're companies with more women on them, uh, they'll find more new innovation, uh, it's kind of redundant, uh, more innovation. Um, if businesses are run by cultural diverse leadership teams, same thing. And so I'd like to lead us into the next slide, um, which talks about another article um, that we published, um, had by, uh, uh, written by David Rock, and about how it can feel uncomfortable. So I was kind of alluding to that a little bit earlier. It can be a little bit uncomfortable to be um, on a diverse team. And we can, well, no, actually, don't go to the next slide yet. Um, and Esther, you might want to pipe in uh, here. But there's an actual paradox. So people feel uh, a little less effective and, and, and more uncomfortable, but ironically, they actually perform better. So again, I could come to you with any number of studies that show, and I, I can walk you through one that's um, on the next slide, where they basically had uh, a task for, and there were some homogeneous teams and there were some diverse teams. And as you see here on the graph on the left, people on these teams um, who were from the diverse group, they felt that their teams weren't as effective because, you know, it's like, it's not very, it wasn't simple. It was a little bit hard. And they felt that they weren't as effective. Um, the diverse teams also weren't very confident in their performance. But if we could advance to the next slide, what we found or what they found was they actually performed better than the homogeneous teams. And so it's really important to realize that diverse teams, when we have it coupled with inclusion, perform really well. And it's very important to have the buy-in for the leaders to understand this. Again, it's not just let's bring in numbers, but we value diversity. We value the perspectives and the experiences that people bring in. And we set those norms. Then we create the conditions for better performance. Esther, I'd love to invite you in. And if you'd like to add anything. Yes. Um, I also wanted to share here that we really need to 
pause and think about what that means. So we often say diverse teams are better and that's great. And remember a time when you spoke to somebody from your city, right? Or from your school, you immediately found that bond with them. And it was such an easy conversation. You were on the same page. So it feels good. Yet when it comes to diverse teams, it's much harder to find that common denominator, find that common idea, yet the ideas and the decisions are stronger. So what that means for leaders is that we really need to start thinking about what are the values that we're actually communicating as important within our company? Because we're talking about speed and agility, and what we mean is fast decisions, that that actually goes against diversity and inclusion. Yet when, if we level up and we start talking about the importance of being heard, the importance of collaborative uh, environments and the importance of innovation within it, then it is a very different story. And we also often confuse fast with good. Right. And, yeah. and so if I get add one more piece before you um, uh, pipe in, David, it's, it's it's also, it's like valuing, like those values. It's like we actually value all the voices that are at the table. And I'd like to extend it out to what we talk about um, at NLI is for people to bring their authentic selves to work. We bring all of who we are to work and not like, oh, I have to hide the fact that I have, you know, different aspects of diversity. It's there and we bring it in and to know when we value that then it's accepted. We understand there might be friction, but all these different perspectives are valued and appreciated. Yeah, I just wanted to bring this in. It was a slide we had at the back, sort of in case we wanted to just, I think it's relevant. You know, there's, it's, it's really helpful to have further language around diversity itself. Like there's, there is cognitive diversity. It's sort of, there's been a lot of talk about cognitive diversity, but that can be an excuse for, um, you know, hiring all straight white men from, you know, different, different countries. Um, but actually identity diversity is really important. I don't have the data here top of mind. I know we've written on this, so maybe someone can put it in the chat, but identity diversity, which is very visible, but not always, not just visible, uh, has a, a significant bump in terms of improved performance over just cognitive diversity. So yes, cognitive diversity is helpful, but identity diversity actually matters a lot more. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll put a piece. So you know, these are some of the things that we kind of dig into. But let's go back. I want to make sure, just managing time a little bit, I want to make sure we have time to um, kind of address uh, this and, and, and go a little deeper and make sure we have time for your questions. I actually wouldn't mind polling you about what you're currently using. So we've got another poll and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of go into some of the common pitfalls uh, and then we, we should have a good five to 10 minutes for questions. But let's, let's put this poll up, uh, Gabe, if you could. Um, so, so what we're interested in is, is what you, um, uh, you know, what you're currently using to mobilize your leaders based on our definition here, and you might have a whole different thing. If you've got like a whole different approach, maybe put it in the chat or you want to attack our framework and, and improve it or tell us how we're wrong. Love it. Please do. Um, but yeah, but otherwise just, you know, if, if it makes sense for you to pick one of these, pick one of these, what are you currently doing? And put in the chat how it's working, if you've already voted. Right, some are doing, we, we should have an all of the above category, sorry. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, I mean, if you can do all of the above, that's probably good, but I would say weighted, probably the ideal from our perspective would be weighted towards the mechanisms, but we're scientists, we always think like that. <laughs> there are certainly some companies that really reject that and say, actually, we just want the emotional buy-in and that's what we're gonna anchor on fully. Uh, there are some organizations that wanna really anchor there um, some want to really anchor in the middle. Interesting. We'll give you another five seconds. We've got about 80. Let's see if we can get a few more. How are you currently mobilizing your leaders? Let's close that off in five, four, three, two, one. All right. Let's see what that data says. Um, relatively even, right? Interesting. But about a third, of, roughly a third, a third, a third, less on the mechanisms, but emotional buy-in and outcome studies, roughly equal. Uh, and explain the mechanisms. I mean, I think the insight we want you to have is choose intentionally. Um, and also choose intentionally for the different places on the curve, like which one's gonna work for different groups, you know, on this curve. And while that might be, you know, just a, a nice thought to have for a team of, 
you know, 20 leaders, if you're going to actually build a strategy to really mobilize a thousand leaders or 10,000 leaders as we do, now you really want to start thinking about getting this right. Um, you know, you don't want to just guess at uh, how to mobilize 10,000 leaders. You want to be really thoughtful about which of these strategies and at which point in the bell curve and build it that way. Fantastic. So let's, um, let's go a little further. We want to talk about some of the traps that we've seen around mobilizing leaders specifically. So remember, we're talking about the mobilizing stage. We're not talking about like creating habits or creating systems. We're just talking about that first stage of um, kind of creating priority um, and uh, kind of what to do there. So, so, you know, some of the traps, do you want to, um, Esther, do you want to talk through uh, some of these? Sure, I can. Um, so the first one here is really trying to convince leaders that they're biased versus focusing on the goals and making sure that, um, again, we're, we're challenging positively, right? So, so within it, even when we talk about bias, we say, you, you have a brain, therefore you have bias, and that is okay. So watch how you're communicating that cor correctly. Um, the second one here is around um, forcing somebody into diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and mandating it versus making things compelling. There's a lot of research that shows that you should not be mandating the programs and mandating the training and that it actually causes opposite results. The next one here is around doing some one-off activities or one-off briefings, for instance, instead of really investing in habit formation and investing in taking a journey with the leaders in really generating that buy-in and building long-term strategies. Curious what comes up, David. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, uh, Julie asks an interesting question. I just started reflecting on it. You know, what tools do we have to measure where they are? Uh, I guess on this bell curve is what she's talking about. You know, we're, 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 We've not been until the last like maybe two years, we've not been very involved in assessment at all. We're, we're in the habit activation at scale business. Um, so we have about in the last couple of years, we've started to really develop some, some tools there. Um, I think it's interesting and, and maybe we can, that can be a segue to starting to answer a few of the questions. So please um, feel free to type in some questions or thoughts to share as well. But Esther, do you want to sort of take that one? You know, how would, how would we imagine an NLI kind of measuring where leaders are at this point? I don't think we can, because when it comes to the buy-in uh, for diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, the leaders have so much pressure right now that when it comes to specific surveys, it's going to be close to impossible to actually see the right results. That being said, what is important here is through the conversations and through the actual workshops and working with the leaders and helping them define how to speak about diversity, equity, and inclusion comfortably. Within that, how do we shift the scale a little bit? Or how do we open to clumsy conversations among the leaders so that those that are not bought in feel like their opinion can be heard and valued and they won't be peer pressure from others to force them to say something else? Because our goal is for them not to say it, but rather to actually act like it. That being said, we do think that data and assessing um, really works and when it comes to employees overall, and we do hold engagement surveys and organizational climate surveys that are based on the science. Yeah, one thing we might do that we, ha we actually have available for that um, is we just start, we're just about to launch this, um, is a, a, an anonymous focus group that's 100% anonymous. People feel super confident because asking leaders directly, where are you on this bell curve? They're not going <laughs> to respond accurately, right? Um, but asking sort of the, the employees about particular le leaders, for example, right? Asking the team super anonymously and a really good focus group. So basically like a Zoom, but with 100 people where no one can see anyone, everyone's got a number, all this, and, and like really getting in and collecting data that way. That's possible. Um, a little, you know, fraught with some challenges, but we're starting to do that. And we definitely do a lot of focus group work, but I, I think there's ways to do it. Um, and certainly reach out to us directly if you're interested kind of in, in actually brainstorming on that. We, we would be able to come up with some kind of solution, but people are overloaded right now for sure. 
That also brings up for me, David, that when we talk about inclusion, we say that the leaders, I've never heard leaders say, I don't want to be inclusive or I'm not inclusive, but that goes back to intent versus impact. So we interview and do the focus groups and really pull their teams to show the leaders where the teams think they're actually at. Yeah, fantastic. Mikaela? I, I was just um, seeing a, a response from uh, Dan, Danny um, about resistant leaders. So I just throw that out there, like what about resistant leaders in general? But to her question, what about swaying resistant leaders with pure slash competitive pressure? As in, if my competitor is doing this, then we should do too, so as not to lose advantage. And it kind of brings up, you know, what are people's motivations? Like some people might be like the numbers that works well for me because my competitors are doing better. Others it's like, no, this is a moral issue. This is the right thing to do. So I just love to hear your comments kind of in this. Yeah, um, it's, it's an interesting track and we've got about five minutes for questions and comments. So please throw those questions in the chat um, and then we'll, we'll close with a couple of announcements. But uh, look, the research on how you get people to really do something you want them to do is that believing everyone else is doing it is the strongest motivator. So, so, so you want to harness that principle. Um, and so believing everyone else is doing something uh, is a really powerful motivator. Now, in an organization, it's, it's probably believing that people above you are doing it, right? Because then you feel a status threat if you're not doing it. So feeling like the people above you are doing something uh, and everyone is doing it, it's important. Feeling like all your competitors are doing it, also going to be very motivating, right? Um, so, so I think you want to tap into that. And that sort of has us think about strategies where um, kind of the, you know, the middle, the passionate middle is empowered to become really, not passionate, the sort of the, the supportive middle are, are given tools to become even more passionate and kind of expand and bring some of the bottom people along without directly addressing those. But if, if you could kind of increase the middle, you know, 10%, but thousands of people, 10%, um, you're going to bring a lot of folks at the bottom al along. And that's, um, that from, from our perspective, that's probably from a systems perspective, a powerful way to do it when you're talking about scale versus sort of going after the bottom folks. But it comes from the principle that uh, thinking everyone else is doing something uh, is going to really bring people along. I would also say that within it, it's very important to actually do stakeholder mapping because for instance, if your CEO is actively against it doesn't matter how many people are in the middle or supportive, right? It is critical to get their buy-in within it. So the, one of the other steps to do there is really map out who is the decision-making within it and where to target your effort. Yeah, yeah, Mikhail? Oh, just, sorry, I was just reading through the, the chats and the, yeah. the questions there, so. Yeah, no worries. I mean, I'll share a comment while you see what else is there, Mikhail. Um, you know, I've worked one on one with a few CEOs. So quite, quite often I'll get a call or a text or something from a CHRO saying, you know, can I talk to you privately? It was sort of, you know, designing a big rollout for 50,000 or 100,000 people. And I'll get this message, hey, I need to talk to you privately. And the message will go something like, and, and I've had this 20 times, something like, this is all great, everyone's on board, but I need you to work with the CEO. And I need you to somehow do some magic with the CEO so that they're on board. And I've, you know, obviously thought hard, long and hard about what that magic is. And in the end, the one thing that's really worked um, and, and, is, is, and I've had a lot of these conversations, is, is literally saying, you know, have you ever had an experience where you felt really, really right about something um, and it ended up later, you were really, really wrong and it cost you a ton of money and time and pain. And, and I haven't had a CEO yet say, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Everyone said like, yeah, actually, and then we start talking about it. And now I personally, in my real life, have had those experiences. And I you know, share some examples where I was really sure I was right and ended up being really wrong. It was really expensive. Um, and for me, it's like, okay, um, you know, we want to reduce those. So, so this is actually about, um, you know, greater diversity, equity, and inclusion is actually about being right more often. And, and by that meaning, like, hitting the market the right way, you know, innovating the right way, listening to your customers the right way, you know, speeding up your solutions the right way. Like it's actually about achieving your goals with fewer errors um, and, and, and ultimately making better decisions. So where I land on it with the CEO anyway is um, we're going to help you make fewer of those really dumb decisions. But by the way, you're going to need your, your team's help because no matter what I teach you about bias, you can't do much about it without actually your team calling each other out on bias. So you're going to need to learn this language, speak it, model it, um, 
and, and, and kind of, you know, you role model it and then they'll do it with their teams and then it'll start to happen. And they sort of get that and, and, and so the journey begins. So uh, it's fun to tell that story. And, and just basing off a little bit of our research on power, it's like, you know, leaders are imbued with the, you know, with, with power. And, and sometimes what happens is people get very goal focused on their business goals and forget about the people. And so David, what you're helping them do is to bring their focus back on their people. And that's really, um, really important to do with leaders. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we've done a lot of research on power. Maybe we can throw one of those big pieces in the chat. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about power and equity and all of that at the summit. Actually, the close of day one, we've got a really, really exciting session um, looking at um, like fairness, equity, power, all of that from a research perspective. But the, um, uh, the work we've done on power is really interesting. We kind of organized into there's three big effects on the brain. It impacts how you think about people, how you think about risk, how you think about details. Um, and there are both positive and negative sides to it. There's a, a whole world to unpack another time. Maybe we could do a, a whole one of these sessions on power. Um, well, come to the summit. There's a, there's a lot on it there. We could throw, there was a piece in Quartz uh, on power and some others that we've done. Uh, we do need to wrap up. I want to just give uh, Esther a moment to talk about kind of ways we can help you. Also, we'll, we'll, we'll throw up a, uh, a poll of sort of different things you can choose. So if anyone wants to kind of jump off, before you do jump off, just a, I want to give a huge plug for the summit. Come for free to day one, day two, day three sessions. It's the 10th, 11th, and 12th of November, if nothing else. Totally free. Um, day one is literally the science of change. Day two is how to build a better normal. And day three is how to do strategic DNI. Um, the opening session. So we're giving those away free. And then if you want to come to everything else, which will be just as amazing, if not more, uh, the tickets under $500, but summit.neuroleadership.com. We'll put a link in the chat as well. Uh, check out the program. It's an extraordinary program and series of speakers. So I uh, just want you to, to, you know, hold that in your calendar the morning, like nine to 11, something like that uh, of 10th, 11th, 12th of November before you jump off. But um, Esther, do you want to talk about sort of some of the things that we're doing in this space? Um, and uh, we'll, we'll let people, uh, let people, uh, you know, drop off uh, in about uh, three, four minutes. Definitely would love to. So this is exclusively what we do when it comes to mobilizing leaders. We do a lot of work as well when it comes to building out long-term strategies and habit formation. So when it comes to mobilizing leaders, the first part is really briefings that we do when it comes to executive briefings on all of those three categories that we talked about or DNI research briefings by researchers. And that way we initiate the buying by anchoring on the science and reinforcing the business case for diversity, equity, and inclusion. The next one is one-on-one -on -one working sessions with some of your leaders, coaching sessions. If you feel like they're not budding quite yet, David mentioned some of the examples there. We can also work with the whole team. The last one that's really, really powerful is actually helping you um, help leaders see what the employees are actually experiencing. And these are the listening circles where we host them or we help leaders learn how to host them and then bring you the insights and bring you some of the biggest challenges that they, your employees currently have within the organization. What can also help when it comes to your town halls, we've seen examples of when it goes really badly. And so we're here for you if you need some help and support for town halls. And the last one is the survey. So we have employee engagement surveys. We have our organizational climate surveys that are really grounded on the signs and behaviors much more than just a pulse check. So th this is a sweet, the, um, yeah. That's, thanks. Uh, if you're interested in the um, listening circles, uh, he says talking over someone. Um, sorry, the um, ir irony of that. The, uh, the listening circles, we actually have a podcast of the whole session we did on listening. So we've done a lot of work on listening circles themselves. We did a whole Friday like this, just on listening circles, how to design them, the science of them. That's now a podcast. So um, maybe someone can put that in the chat as well. So we've, we've dug specifically uh, into that um, as well. And then uh, I think these are some feedback. I think these are sessions that you did, Esther. And I asked you specifically, were the exclamation marks things we put there or were they actually CEO exclamation marks? And actually see your exclamation marks there were a lot of them let's give you a moment to read that so some really helpful comment and this is really anchoring on the mechanisms right so very little on the emotional at all little bit on the outcome studies like 90 percent on the um you know we're like 90 percent on the um the mechanisms and really going into that so some interesting uh, interesting comments there um overall 
Um, all right, so Michaela, anything you want to add there before we kind of wrap up and do some some closing comments? No, I just appreciate being able to talk uh, about this with you and really appreciated the comments, the really thoughtful, insightful comments and questions that came through. I wish we could unpack them more, but maybe we'll have our other opportunities and other webinars. And definitely, if you come and join the summit, we'll be able to unpack some of these topics yeah, more. Yeah. And, and if you think we should do a session on power, let us know. Put it in the chat. If there's other topics. Okay. Yes, through, right. I think somebody did say that. Yes. Yeah, we might uh, explore that, actually. It's good. Um, just a comment on the summit. Uh, we don't have a link, I think, ready yet. But you'll get, if you're in our database, you get stuff from us. You'll definitely get an announcement about the free sessions. But otherwise, go to summit.neuroleadership.com. Someone could throw that in the chat now um, to learn about the program and see it and kind of, you know, put it in your calendar and all that. So uh, there'll be a link soon in terms of just watching the first sessions for free, but have a look there for now. A couple other quick closing announcements. Uh, we have a thing called the NLI challenge. If you are struggling to rethink learning and, and behavior change in this time, give us, throw us into the NLI challenge. You literally show us your budget. We show you how to do something way better, way cheaper, way faster based on real science. So that's what the NLI challenge is. If you're uh, kind of interested in that. Uh, if you're from a client, please ignore this slide. Um, if you're uh, if you love science and you're in change and you're passionate about this kind of work, you know, check out our website. We're, we're doing quite a lot of hiring. We're actually having our biggest six months ever. Uh, so we are hiring. It's you know we're pretty specific about the kind of roles and people and all of that. But uh, we're definitely hiring. Uh, this is the summit. Um, we've been talking about it. I'll just show you very briefly. Uh, the theme is build a better normal. Day one is from the lab. Um, Big sessions on perspective taking, empathy, equity, quality, fairness. I just mentioned learning today. Day two is priorities. So build a better normal we open with. Big session on allyship, how to thrive through crisis. Um, someone's asking about hiring. Uh, just go to neuroleadership.com and you'll see a, a link for, for careers. Um, or someone could throw the careers link in the chat right now, perhaps. Uh, so day two, priorities. And then day three is um, uh, from the field. And then we added this extra layer, which hopefully will work and experiment each day also has two tracks kind of foundations if you're new and then kind of what's, uh, you know, what's sort of relevant now. Um, so each day also has kind of foundations plus cutting edge stuff within within each day as well. Uh, and lots and lots of sessions um, of networking with like peers and sort of different interest groups. It's going to be the most connected kind of most integrated event we've ever done. Um, and then this is just a scattering of sort of some of the people presenting, um, lots of folks from amazing companies. Um, we've got uh, some incredible CHROs from, from Zoom um, and all sorts of interesting companies. Joe Whittinghill, who's the chief uh, talent officer from uh, Microsoft. Uh, we have uh, the um, Amy Eds Edmondson, who uh, is uh, done the amazing work on um, psychological safety and all sorts of other people. Look at this, Tracy, I know you're with us here. You've got your picture there as well. Thanks for joining today. Um, I think that's it for me. Just uh, a big thank you to uh, Michaela, Esther, uh, and Gabe putting this together today. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, love your feedback, keep it coming. Any topics you think we should do, let us know. Um, we do have two big DNI sessions coming up. Uh, we've got one actually on the concept of being anti-racist and how to approach that. Is you're getting sort of pressure on that idea and how do you approach that concept of being anti-racist? Uh, and we have another one. Esther, do you want to tell us about the other one? I think it's with a really interesting organization as well. Yes, and so we're so excited. Um, so the head of diversity at New T-Mobile, so as you know, T-Mobile and Sprint merged, and they've made a lot of commitments to really drive their diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts forward. And we've been partnering with them a lot in it. And so we have the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion talking with us about our work together and how they really built this long-term sustainable strategy for culture transformation. Yeah, fantastic. No, it's, we'll be talking about strategic DNI. and um, Gabe, when is the anti-racist session? Someone's already asking about that. Uh, we can... uh, yeah, that's next Friday, same day, same time next as Friday. today. We're digging in, we're a little nervous, but we're, we're gonna dig in. Thanks again, Gabe, uh, Michaela, Esther. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, Gabe, over to you for some uh, closing comments. Thanks, Thanks David. Thank you so much.